All right, we are now joined by Chris Doring of the SEC Network, and of course, it's time at the University of Florida and the NFL and the BCSI Hotline. Chris, how you doing, man? I'm good. Good to be back with you, man. It means uh, something exciting right around the corner here with football just about two weeks away. Yes, sir. What's up with Burns making fun of you for wearing shorts today? What was up with that? He, he makes fun of me for anything. You know, and I'm actually, I'm okay. I can just roll with it. You know, I don't get quite as sensitive as some people do. But yeah, he was on me for wearing uh, shorter shorts. And here's the deal. I, I have a 17-year-old son that if I wear shorts that are too long, he's going to get on me. Burns gets on me for being too short, so I can't win in any of my settings, bro. Yeah, well, you know, growing up, we got away from the short shorts, but now it's all yeah. back. That's what all the guys are wearing. Not only did uh, my son wear the short shorts, but he rolls them at the top, too, to make them even more short. So, yeah, I, I, it's a little too uncomfortable for me. I, I can get away with the, the seven-inch, maybe, maybe a five-inch bathing suit, but uh, I can't do much shorter than that. That's a little too much for us like you said guys like you and i that that uh, transitioned into the, the the fab five longer shorts that's, that's exactly right so let's talk about college football being right around the corner with a week and some change between uh before we get the nebraska illinois game what does it mean for you as we are now like we've had all the talking points chris i've been hosting this show and like i've run out of talking points we need some games yeah. and now it's coming it's funny you know we're doing sec now uh last night and then again you know coming up here uh tonight and just you really feel like you've exhausted every possible way to present stuff heading into the year. Let's talk about the most intriguing SEC games, the most intriguing out-of-conference games. Who are your, your favorite 11 offensively, favorite defense? Like, let, let's get to it so we actually have some new talking points. But I, I think it's interesting this time of year, and it seems to happen when we go to SEC media days and then from then to the season, is that we hear things, we say things, and we haven't had any games to disprove any theories. So – it becomes almost like an echo chamber. You're repeating the same things over and over again, actually believing them. Uh, so I think it's interesting when we finally kick the ball off, just how many of those things we were sure about as we got to the end of August uh, are disproven when we get to September. So what did you make of the AP poll? SEC, obviously, all over it. What was it, three of the top six? And also, at five in the top 25? You know, I was actually a little surprised. Um, Georgia was the one that kind of stood out to me the most. I think with, with all that they have returning – uh, in terms of continuity of coaching staff, you get back your your quarterback, you feel good about where your offense finished last season, the defense is going to be stacked. Now, I thought that was a team that might be a little bit higher. Um, I think you could make the op opposite argument for Alabama with all that they lose and all the coaching turnover and, and what they're going to have to be doing to try to uh, assimilate to a new offense uh, with everybody, you know, kind of uh, figuring their spots out with so much production loss. Like, uh, that's, I guess we're going off of historical ability to – you know, uh, uh, wash, rinse, repeat. But at the same time, you know, I, at some point in time, it's got to cause them trouble, I would expect. Uh, just, you know, I, I keep waiting for that roulette wheel. It's been black over and over again. We keep betting that it's going to be red. And uh, Nick Saban and company keep proving that they don't really take a step back. Yeah, and, and more on Georgia, I agree with you from a talent perspective. But they're hurting right now. Is it two or three other receivers going to be out? To, how yeah. does that affect them heading into that first Clemson game? Well, I mean, I, I think more so than maybe even the receivers. I look at Erickson, the center, potentially uh, being out with, with, you know, the guy that's in, in charge of not only you know, making all the calls up front, but getting the football to start the play to the quarterback. Uh, that's a potential issue. I think the offensive line for them is going to have uh, a little bit of a, a difficulty acclimating and, and kind of figuring out as they've reshuffled a lot of guys in the offseason. Um, you, you know this. I mean, that's the most important unit on the field and being able to play as one group as opposed to five individuals takes time. So I, I do think that's going to be a tough challenge facing a, a, maybe one of the best defensive lines or the best in the country this year in Clemson. So uh, that that's a concern for me. But in terms of pass catchers, you know, that was a, a spot for Georgia that I thought was really going to be solid heading into this season. And, and you had the, the, the Pickens injury, obviously, that, that kept him out. But Arie Gilbert now, his absence, and, and uh, Burton and, and Kiaris Jackson both coming back from injuries. There's a lot of question marks there, too. So it's, uh, it, it is something that I think that's created a little bit of concern if you're a Georgia fan. Keeping up with that top five, do you, do you buy the Oklahoma hype out there? Yeah, well, why are we we're, we're talking Oklahoma hype because we actually believe that the defensive line has made incredible strides. Um, I think it's going to be interesting, and, and the sooner that it happens – the more interesting I think it's going to be because they think they've improved to the level of the SEC, but I'd love to see what that actually looks like when they hold up 
you know, against a, a, an SEC offensive line and they're measured every week against the, the top defensive lines in our conference. So I, I don't necessarily believe it. They've done a great job of navigating the Big 12 and getting to the college football playoff year in and year out. But that first you know, semifinal exit that we know is coming every season, I think at the hands of the SEC is a prelude of what you're going to see when they first try to acclimate to this conference. Chris, I, I think that's a great point because when we're thinking about what Texas is going to do, what Oklahoma is going to do, it took a a while. If it, if it wasn't for Johnny Football, those first two years could have been pretty lean. Uh, now I go to practice and I see SEC dudes all over the place. They're, Jimbo's recruiting at a different level. Yeah, I think two reasons for that. One, and, and I mean, we're talking about uh, DeMarvin Leal, one of the best defensive linemen in the entire country this year, was actually recruited by the previous staff. So I guess I, I, I can't say this with absolute certainty, but Jimbo Fisher has coached in the SEC for a long time as an assistant, understands what it takes to win in this league. You know, I think he's not only recruited great players, uh, they've de- developed them really, really well. They've created a physical atmosphere and practice that you would probably know much better than I do. But hearing the stories about the way they get after it uh, reminds me a lot of, you know, some of the practices that we were a part of in the SEC when I was coming up. Um, and, and then, you know, Mike Elko, I, I just I look at what he's done in terms of the commitment to being a great run stopping defense. And um, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk to our boy Billy Lucci the other day and, and talked about the comparisons between A&M's defensive line and, and Alabama and Georgia's defensive lines. You look at them on tape. They are very, very similar in terms of the way they look, the way they built. And, and maybe this year, the depth of talent that they have. I think that's the thing that separates really good defensive lines in our conference. Everybody has talent on the defensive line. But how many how many waves of, of defensive linemen can you roll in there without losing anything from your, your first team unit to the second, third guys? Chris, when uh, I, I hear people talk about Jimbo, what he's been able to do with his offense, one of the one of the knocks I hear is that pro style offense, he hasn't evolved. Do you think that's a knock or is it more of a this is the personnel he's got and he's going to maximize what he has? I think there's a little bit of both when it comes to coaching. Everybody has a preference with the way they'd like to play schematically. Uh, but I think a good coach does tailor his offense around uh, uh, the skill set of his, his roster. But let's not forget, I mean, it was only a couple of years ago we were remarking about the idea of A&M even utilizing a tight end. Uh, Jalen Weidermeyer has become one of the best in the country uh, in that role, using a fullback, which I think you, you talk to, uh, to Isaiah Spiller, he loves having a guy running in front of him I and mean, being able to run downhill with a lead blocker. Uh, so I, I, as much as everybody's kind of moved to the spread style, um, which Jimbo Fisher has implemented some of those dynamics into his offense, he knows what he wants to be. And I think there's something to be said for having authenticity when it comes to uh, the type of, of team you're trying to build and the schemes you're using. So obviously I'm inside and I see it a certain way, but when, when you see the playmakers beyond Jalen Watermeyer and you look at what Demas could be and A-Chain in the backfield, Isaiah Spiller and Anaya Smith, I, I feel like they have so many different types of weapons that it can really open up that playbook. No, I believe I, I agree with you 100%. You know, the thing that I want to see is more realized potential from the wide receiver position. I, I, I was sick last year, even though Caleb Chapman was lighting up my, my, my Gators, it was fun watching him kind of have that breakout game. I'm excited about seeing him back and, and be healthy. But there's there's still a lot of, of guys that were highly recruited players at the wide receiver position that I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg from. So I'm excited to see how they continue to develop. And again, you know, I don't know that there's many coaching staffs or head coaches that, that are able to develop talent the way that Jimbo Fisher does and, and what his resume has shown to do in the past. Hey, Chris, I, I saw you guys tweeting about it, or at least Burns was that you guys talked about it on your show. What, what's up with Mike Leach? I guess some fans didn't think he was engaged or what, what's going on there? Well, we played some sound from Paul Feinbaum who said that, you know, Mike Leach has not done a, a great job of really indoctrinating himself into the community there. And when, when you find yourself in the gray area, which he feels like he inevitably will, that he hasn't made a whole lot of, of, of inroads and friends there that can buy him some time. I don't necessarily agree with that. First and foremost, you know, a coach's job is not to be a politician. A coach's job is to win football games. So if you're, if you're winning football games, it doesn't matter how big of a, uh, um, you know, a guy that, that can be a little bit grumpy. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's when you, you find yourself not winning games. And I think that, that, um, he does a great job of focusing on what's important. And I also saw, you know, I don't know if you saw the tweet that was retweeted by Matt Wyatt, uh, something that he, he had written recently, but all of the different things that did list 
the way that he had kind of indoctrinated himself and ingratiated himself to that that community. So I, I think there were some some misnomers maybe out there about the type of, of coach he's been and the type of community member that he's been. And um, it, it was great discussion, as you know, trying to fill three hours of radio in the offseason can be challenging. So it, it led to some good discussion today, both on the air and on social media. Hey, Chris, last thing for you. Did you see the uh, story about the South Carolina um, assistant or grad assistant getting a chance to be with a quarterback group, a guy who, who comes with a pretty good name? Yeah, it sounds like uh, like what we see in basketball a lot, you know, where one of the managers gets a chance to to move into being a a, a guy that's on the end of the bench and all. So I, I don't know that he's going to get many reps, but it's it's certainly a cool story to to think about, you know, a coach being able to cross over and and uh, and relive some of those playing days. Yeah, I, I want my chance, Chris. Hey, thanks so much for joining us, man. You're always so accommodating, so so polite. We look forward to seeing you on SEC on the SEC Network and all the great stuff you do with Burns. No, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me back and look forward to catching up once the season gets going.